Hi, my name is Dustin Robinson, and I will be your moderator for this panel called Across the Value Chain. Uh, I wear three hats in the psychedelic industry. My first hat is my investment hat. I'm the managing principal at Eater Investments, which is a venture capital firm that is deploying capital across the psychedelic biotech ecosystem. My second hat is my legal hat. I'm an attorney and a CPA, and I founded a law firm that exclusively focuses on the psychedelic and cannabis industries. And my third hat is my advocacy hat. I founded a nonprofit, a 501c4 at the end of 2019 that is focused on legal reform of psychedelics. And through these various position, positions, I believe I've kind of obtained a unique perspective on the different parts of the value chain. And my venture capital firm kind of categorizes each part of these value chain into, into four categories. The, the first category is drug development companies and, and companies developing different routes of administration, whether it be transdermal, nasal, uh, lozenges. Uh, the second category that we place these companies in is the pro producers of these APIs. And these are the companies that will be supplying these drug compounds to these drug development companies. And, and really right now, most of these psychedelic compounds are just in clinical trials. So right now on the production side, it's mainly producing these compounds for these drug development companies to go into clinical trials. But once these compounds become approved, um, these production companies will be supplying these compounds for administration to patients as FDA approved drugs or Health Canada approved drugs or whatever jurisdiction they're in. The third category is where we really see a, a paradigm shift in the in, in in the psychiatric industry, and that's that's the clinics. So that's the the third category is the clinics. And right right now, the paradigm we see with mental and behavioral health disorders is that you go to a psychiatrist, um, they will give you a prescription. You go to a pharmacy to fill your prescription, whether it be an SSRI or a benzo, and you take that drug at home. Under the current paradigm, the FDA is approving these psychedelic compounds under REMS, risk evaluation mitigation strategies, which essentially require that these compounds are administered at a facility or at a clinic. So that is the third category. And then the fourth category that we place these companies in is kind of the catch-all. It, it's technology and the infra infrastructure to support this industry. And at each part of these different segments of the industry, there's different value propositions, there's different opportunities, and there's also different challenges. And that's precisely what we're looking to explore on this panel. So what we're gonna do to kick it off is I'm gonna let each of the panelists introduce themselves. I'm gonna start off with Anthony. So Anthony, if you could give a quick introduction. Hey, Dustin, how are you? Good, good, good to talk to you and great to get the opportunity here. So um, good to speak to everyone in the audience. Uh, my name is Anthony Tennyson. I'm a co-founder and chief executive of Awaken Life Sciences. Uh, and Awaken Life Sciences, we do two things. Uh, we do them really well, but it's really simple. Uh, we develop um, and deliver psychedelic drugs, therapies, and enabling technologies to better treat addiction. Uh, addiction affects physical or substance addiction affects about 20% of the global adult population with another significant, and I like Dustin, the way you brought in behavior addictions, another significant percentage of the adult population are also negatively affected by, by addiction. And the current treatment paradigms, as you mentioned before, they're not that effective, which results in a significantly negative impacts on individuals, their families, and their communities. And it is what we believe to be the biggest unmet medical need of our times. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Next panelist we're going to present is Haim. Hello, Dustin. Uh, hello, hello, Anthony. Uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Haim Rakla. I'm uh, CEO of, uh, of SciTech, the company that's putting on this event. And uh, at SciTech, in addition to the, uh, the advocacy and the community creation that's enabled by events like these, our educational platform, our webinars, um, we have two business lines, one under the brand uh, Tovana, which anybody who just listened to the previous 10 minutes will be branded Wisana soon. Uh, and those are clinics in the United States. And these are psychiatry-led integrated mental health 
uh, facilities that are inclusive of psychedelic assisted therapies. And uh, the second is uh, Tovana Solutions, which are professional grade digital clinical tools to enable the therapeutic community to deliver these novel modes of care, these modalities of care. Thank you, Haim. And Nadia, you're next. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dustin. Hi, Anthony. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Nadia Vander Hayden. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for SciGen Industries, uh, which basically means I sell drugs. Um, I joined SciGen about a year and a half ago. Um, I have a previous background in critical care, aviation retrieval medicine, basically working in helicopters, and uh, kind of burned out in that and wanted to pivot. And, and now I spend most of my days building relationships with other companies in the industry. Um, SciGen's main focus is, is basically quality and non-exclusive supply chain solutions. Um, we're in full swing with the construction of a facility in um, Calgary, we believe it's the first dedicated psychedelic manufacturing facility in the world, and um, we'll be focusing on supporting other companies in this space through their drug, drug approval process. Thank you so much. And our panelists definitely represent end-to-end -end the value chain within the psychedelic industry. So very representative of the complete value chain, what we have right here. So we're going to start off with Anthony. Um, I know Awaken, one of their main focuses is, is drug development, and we see a lot of the venture capital firms and a lot of the investors are very, very interested in the drug development side of the psychedelic industry. So my question is, what is it about drug development in the psychedelic space that's attra attracting so much investment? And what is it about Awaken that di differentiates you guys from the other psychedelic drug development companies? Um, so, hey, that, that's a great question. And, and thanks, thanks for pitching it to me. Um, so I think from a VC perspective, um, why is it so attractive from a VC perspective? It's because it's easy to model, right? Um, it's the present net present value of 20 years future revenue, future future potential revenue. Um, so therefore it's quite easy for, for VCs and investors to model it and therefore that for to, to stick it into their investment models uh, and therefore them to work out does it fit in within their, their risk appetite and their investment appetite. So really it's, it, to me, it's, it's kind of that simple and it's why, you know, potentially investors or VCs are more interested in the drug discovery side rather than the healthcare side, because on the healthcare side, it tends to be valuations based upon an EBITDA multiple, which is harder to achieve for, for a startup. Um, so that's just me keeping it, keeping it pretty simple. Um, from us, what sets us apart? Um, well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's our potential, right? And it's our potential based upon our focus, uh, our approach and our team. Our focus, our you know, our, our focus, which as I mentioned before, is on better treating addiction where, by developing and delivering psychedelic drugs, therapies, and enabling technologies, and also delivering them. I think we've probably got the most unique focus for any psychedelics company looking to treat addiction. And um, historically, the way that addiction has been treated is just as you mentioned, the analogy you used, Dustin. It's either you know from the drug drug side, it's prescription and sent home, and from the therapy side, it's talk therapy. In, in addiction, um, historically, people have tried to treat addiction from a drug development side from the bottom up. So trying to identify the receptor sites and switch them off, or indeed even swapping out one drug for another, so methadone for heroin. That's just not effective. It's not effective because people just don't understand the brain mechanics properly. So our approach to treat addiction is to come at it from the top down, and it's to develop the next generation of intactogens that will work better and more efficiently, and actually will work across treating both substance addiction and behavioral addiction, which is the biggest unmet medical need of our times, as I mentioned before. Um, it's our approach, which goes across the value chain that you've mentioned before. It's on the development side and also on the delivery side, because you need those four core pillars to work together of compound therapy, therapist, and clinical environment in order to address the issues and the underlying, uh, the symptoms and the underlying issues. And then it's our team, um, world's best team in this space, I believe, Professor David Nutt, Dr. Ben Sessa, Dr. Laurie Higbed, Professor Celia Morgan, and Dr. Sean McNulty. Each one of those are just experts in their field. Yes, and addiction is such a huge unmet need globally. So I, I appreciate and thank you for the work you're doing on that. Haim, I know what you mentioned in your introduction is one of the main focuses for SciTech is, is the clinical side. So could you give the audience just a, an explanation of kind of the role you see clinics playing 
um, as this psychedelic industry evolves? And then also more specifically, you know, what the approach is that SciTech is taking for the clinical model? Sure. Um, it's, it's not a complicated, it's not a complicated role to explain. It is an absolutely pivotal role with which the industry doesn't exist in its absence. It's literally where the rubber meets the road for, for the delivery of care. These are very potent molecules we're, we're talking about. Uh, and uh, while there, there will be other forms of them uh, and other delivery methods developed, the immediate impactful use of, of psychedelics clinically will be under the care of a prescribing MD. Uh, so uh, clinic, the, the clinics as the point of engagement with the patient, I think is, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a disputable discussion. It's the fact of life for, for, for the, the drugs we're talking about in, in development now. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that these drugs and these novel therapies slip easily into today's paradigm of clinical care. These are very much new modalities of care that are being created uh, through the therapeutic use of, of, psychedelic, of psychedelics. Uh, what do I mean when I say a new modality of care? I mean these by and large are not new, uh, simply new prescriptions that are written up and you hit the pharmacy and you take them home and use them as you would any other psychotropic drugs. These, are, uh, these, these aren't about maintaining certain levels of these drugs in your bloodstream. It's about creating uh, an event and a space of time in which um, uh, psychotherapy can become much more effective and impactful. So you're dealing with a different mode of a use of a drug about creating an event, not building up volume in your blood. You're dealing with a different mode of engagement, both pre, during, and then post the integration period. You're dealing with very different time frames, uh, where set and, and set and setting of, of the administration of the drugs. So uh, the summary term is these are new modalities of care. Uh, so the place where they will naturally reside is and this now I'm pivoting into the second part of your question where where SciTech uh, fits in. Uh, these will, will naturally reside in psychiatrists' facilities and psychiatric facilities run by psychiatrists who will have the the license to prescribe. Uh, but these will be new environments for these new modalities of care that are created. And so SciTech's ethos. And I'll stop here and let, let you ask your next question. Cytex ethos is that we want to lead by example the integration of psychedelic assisted therapy into mainstream psychiatry. We do not believe the future is psychedelic assisted therapy standing rebelliously apart from mainstream medicine. That's not how we're going to reach as many people as we possibly can in a world in which we're dealing with absolutely pandemic levels of substance abuse disorders, depression, uh, uh, anxiety disorders, suicidality, etc. We're gonna we're we're gonna be able to realize the impact of these therapies through the integration uh, into mainstream psychiatry. That's awesome, and and I know through our our diligence, I spent a lot of time talking with you about those clinical approaches, and I I really was impressed in you you guys' approach, and really just looking at the psychedelics as just a tool and a catalyst for change, but you really kind of need a full psychiatric model at these clinics to truly support some of these patients. So I think it's a it's a great approach, but there's a lot of different approaches that a lot of different um, clinics are taking. And, and I think the psychiatric approach, holistic approach is the right approach. So so Nadia, our, our drug dealer, it's funny that you kind of talked to, you, you, you described yourself as a drug dealer. My, my grandfather is a pharmacist and he used to always introduce himself as a, as a drug dealer. So so yeah, tell us. So I'll, you know, there's so much focus right now on drug development and then the delivery at the clinics. Why is it that SciGen decided to to really focus on the production side of the industry? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, um, you know, because these drug development companies and the companies providing the delivery all require the same thing. They need a safe, um, you know, reliable source of drugs. I am, you described it as like, you know, rub, rubber meeting the road. Well, we feel like we're the, the fuel that makes the car go forward. You can't, you can't drive if you don't have the fuel. Um, you know, our PR director yeah. describes us as, uh, as, the, as the blood of a human system. So all the organs are the delivery methods and we are the ones pumping the blood to it. So, um, you know, any interruption in supply chain can can disrupt the healing process and grind research to a halt, which is why I think this is called the value chain. We are all linked together. One of us is broken, the rest will also fall. So we just really want to prevent that. We want to build a really strong foundation for supply so that the companies that want to access this material are able to. Um, you know, I think I think where the idea came from is is our founders, Danny Matika and Peter Vander Hayden, who's actually my father, um, had heard repeatedly from researchers that uh, while they were attending conferences that that they had all these clinical trial ideas, but they just could not find a reliable source of GMP material. There was a few groups in the space doing it, but they just couldn't, they didn't have the scale up capability or it was just taking too long to develop it. Um, and, and so they asked the question, you ask the question to all the companies in the space that often I find they don't even think about this until it's, you know, it's really late and they're scrambling to find the material is, is where are you getting your drugs? Um, and what are you paying? Because, I hear these rumors of, of insane per gram pricing and, and it's really, it's not that, it, it isn't. And, and so I encourage people to like to come speak to us and, and see what it's actually about. Um, you know, it's not as simple as, as ordering from a, from a phar pharmaceutical manufacturer in you know, China or India. It's, you can't just put the order in and, and hope that you get it three months later. So, um, you know, our focus in this space is, is developed from recognizing a need um, recognizing the specific skills required to, to deliver that. And then we've created a really incredible production team of chemists and, and now we're just executing that plan. Awesome. And, and an important part of any value chain in any industry is kind of balancing the supply and demand. And you kind of touched on it, Nadia, but could you talk a little bit more about like what the, the, the supply and demand is like currently in the psychedelic industry and how you kind of see that evolving as we have more suppliers enter the market really on the supply side, but also more drug development companies also entering into clinical trials and hopefully and potentially getting their, their drug compounds approved. How do you see that shift occurring with supply and demand? Mm -hmm. I mean, right now the demand is, is just astronomical. I mean, supply is scarce. Um, a lot of groups that are making material, and, and I'll just talk about psilocybin because that's the most popular uh, molecule at the moment. Um, many groups that do actually make it are tied up in exclusivity agreements and therefore have taken themselves out of out of the, the space to be able to provide to everyone else, which is something we really don't wanna do. We're not gonna be exclusive. Um, so I feel at least until our facility is completed, there's a, a huge bottleneck right now. Um, you know, there just isn't the infrastructure to keep up with the demand at this time. And, and I remind all of our customers and anyone who comes to speak, actually anyone who will listen really, is um, the clinical trial ecosystem will, will really only evolve as fast as supply will allow. Um, so everyone is just racing to this finish line and I'm kind of like, hold on a second, everyone just wait, we'll, we'll get there. But, um, you know, everyone is waiting right now. So I probably receive about three or four, maybe five five or six sometimes inquiries a week from organizations that are ready to go. They want to get the trial off the ground and, and they're unfortunately just going to have to get on the wait list right now because that's where we're at. Um, so overwhelmingly, like I said, the synthetic psilocybin is the most popular in terms of what like supply and demand looks like. Um, DMT is also gaining ground. We have people, um, a lot of people are interested in 5-MeO DMT right now, which is also interesting. Uh, it's not a controlled substance in Canada. Um, it may be in other jurisdictions, but I feel like most of the research right now is still in the preclinical or phase one stages. Um, we hear a lot of organizations with ongoing programs doing a lot of press releases about things and describing future, um, you know, future plans, but most of the demand right now I'm seeing is in actually smaller volumes. So I expect that to you know, increase exponentially as bit larger and larger studies happen. And then eventually, you know, the first groups that gain mar hopefully gain market authorization um, will be our customers. That's the plan. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and I want to stay on you, Nadia, for one more follow up question. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the production is really the beginning of the supply chain. 
Um, and so we'll probably see more producers enter the market. But I think a lot of people looking to get into this industry, they don't recognize that there are some significant barriers. So what are some of the, the barriers to kind of enter the production side of the psychedelic industry? Um, I think I mentioned it before, it's just literally the physical infrastructure. Um, we know, especially, you know, I don't want to say the P word, the pandemic, but it's delayed construction delivery supplies worldwide. Everyone is delayed who may be trying to construct something. Um, we have an incredible director of lab operations, Dr. Bree Sebastian. She's been working in miracles, getting our construction moving along. Um, so anyone entering the space, it's, a year, it's like a, probably two years just to build a facility that would be appropriate for this. Um, so while we've been waiting for lab completion, you know, we were lucky to have the opportunity to work with a third party lab for a pilot project and produce about a half a kilo of psilocybin and a small amount of DMT. And that helped some groups get off the start line, basically. So they're often running with their, you know, preclinical and phase one trials with that material. Um, but the barrier really is, is just is just supply. Um, and then, of course, there's regulatory delays that's affecting everyone in this space, potentially. You know, we have a great working relationship with Health Canada, and Canada seems to be a bit of a haven for psychedelic research. Um, but there's delays in receiving um, authorizations and licenses to produce, um, and there's just not enough uh, groups in the space that have it that can collaborate together to move things faster. So, um, and then, and then I think just the the minds that can make this material. It's 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 not just. I mean, yes, there's chemistry is simple for some of the material, but a lot of the drugs are very technical to make, um, and so you have to have that experience behind you. That's awesome. That's awesome. And and in any emerging industry, one of the things we you tend to see is a lot of companies starting to stretch into different parts of the value chain beyond maybe their core competency. And it seems that each of your companies is kind of expanding into different parts of the value chain. Um, this is a question for all of you guys, whoever, whoever wants to go first. But the, the question is, you know, why is it that in these emerging industries like the psychedelic industry, you see companies starting to stretch into other parts of the value chain? And, and what are some of the different parts of the value chain that you guys are trying to touch upon? Anthony, you want to start off? Yeah, sure. H happy to do so. So for, from our own perspective, the reason that we're operating across four different parts of the value chain is because there's those four core pillars of the psychedelic of psychedelics that are required to be delivered in order to deliver, to achieve the significantly better efficacy that, that is expected and required of us as an industry. So you need the drugs, right? So that's why we're running drug development programs and you need the therapies. That's why we're develop, running therapy development programs. So we've got, you know, we've got, we applied for um, ethics approval for a mechanistic study to study ketamine as an intervention to treat gambling use disorder. We're going to be bringing, we've required the license, uh, licensed uh, the IP from the world's only trial for ketamine assisted psychotherapy from the University of Exeter. It was a phase 2AB trial. We're working to bring that forward into phase three. We've got a phase 2B trial nearly started for MDMA assisted psychotherapy for alcohol use disorder. So, again, focusing on the therapy side with those three programs. We've then got the drug discovery program that I mentioned before where we're rapidly progressing. We've partnered with one of the world's leading drug discovery companies, Evotech, about developing the compounds. And the reason that we're focused in those two work streams is because you need the drugs and you need the therapy to work together. Because otherwise, all you're doing is if you're focused on drugs, you're just prescribing and sending people home. And not to disparage the psychiatry industry, but that's how the psychiatry industry currently works. And it's not that bloody effective. Um, we're also then focused on, on digital and we're focused on digital because we operate across trials and clinics, we'll be capturing data at the touch points for participants in our trials and clients in our clinics. And it means very soon, we'll have one of the deepest and most relevant data sets in the industry. And as I mentioned, those four pillars of therapy, sorry, compound therapy therapist, it's the therapist that we believe is one of the key bottlenecks to truly scaling this industry. So how do you create more therapists? Well, you've got to train them as one approach, but what you can also do is you can develop a suite of technologies or enabling technologies to improve the efficiency and consistency around how psychedelic assisted psychotherapy can be delivered. And that's all around data and analytics. You've got to capture the data, you've got to identify the patterns, you've got to identify the variables that improve the probability of success. And once you've done that looking backwards, you can then start to do that looking forwards and projecting forwards. And that's what we're doing in our digital business. Then you've got the delivery business, which is clinics, 
three clinics to be opened in the UK this year, another 17 clinics across the EU and the UK before the end of 2024, which is a 400 million person, $20 trillion a year uh, territory. And that's core, obviously, because you've got the, you got the compounds, you got the therapy, you got the enabling technologies, and then you got where the rubber hits the road, as Hyman said, you got the delivery, right? You got the delivery mechanism. But then we also recognize that there's a significant commercial opportunity beyond the UK, EU. There's a significant population set outside the UK, EU that need help with their addictions and with their mental health ind indications. So what we're going to do, we only want to put clinics in the UK, EU, but we are going to look to package up our protocols, our therapy manuals, our training academy, digital and data analytics tools, and license those into the North American market, for example. And that's why we're, that's the areas that we're operating across the value chain. And it's all just down to those four core pillars of compound, therapy, therapist, and clinics. Awesome. And, and Haim, I know that, you know, you, you were focused originally on where the rubber meets the road on the clinical side, but I know there's been some recent news that has got your company expanding into the drug development side. So yeah, t talk to us a little bit about why you've decided that it was important for you guys to kind of expand into that other part of the value chain. Um, similar to what Anthony uh, said, I won't, um, uh, I'll try not to be repetitious. Uh, we're taking a different approach uh, in terms of the, the focused indications and certainly the geography. Um, we are expanding across the value chain. So the union of Wisana and SciTech uh, brings together what Wisana uh, was doing, which was a focus on uh, initially TBI, though if you look at the symptomology of TBI, traumatic brain injury, for those in the audience that may not know, uh, if you look at the symptomology of TBI and PTSD and even refractory depression, there's, there's a great deal of overlap. So they have a drug development pipeline. Uh, they also, with the recent announcement of um, uh, building the center of excellence at the University of South Carolina, are also focused on um, uh, the, the wellness and the ability to engage a population that is at risk for, for these pathologies. Uh, so they're, they're very much developing interventions uh, for prophylaxis as they're developing uh, therapeutic interventions through drug development. So they're on the, the development side of, of the value chain, that end of the value chain, and we're on the delivery end of the value chain. So the union is an obvious one. There's a, a great deal of complementarity and not much overlap at all, except where overlap makes sense just on, on the business administration front where, where you can become leaner. Um, I, I see the inherent value, uh, commenting on something Anthony said about technology. I couldn't agree more uh, that technology is going to be an enabling factor to get more therapists out there. Uh, I may disagree a little bit about the characterization of psychiatry. Certainly the tools that they have today are wanting, but if you speak to this community, this is a community that will uptake novel therapeutics as soon as they are legally allowed to because they're on the front lines of engaging with a patient base that is suffering because the therapies today are not sufficient. To, to I, 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 even, I, I completely agree because I've got to go and hire lots of psychiatrists, so I better be careful what I say because <laughs> we we we're a medical practice, right? So each clinic is going to be led by a consultant or like all psychiatrists are consultants, but they'll be led by psychiatrists. So it's Absolutely. not, it's more of an observation from some family experience of perhaps the not always as effective treatment methodologies that some psychiatrists yeah. would do. What's failing is, is the, the, the methodologies aren't up to the, I couldn't agree more. The methodologies aren't up to task. If they were, we wouldn't see, and we, we don't use, epidemiological language when we talk about mental pathology, but if you look at the numbers, it's following precisely an epidemiological pa a pandemic pattern. Um, we wouldn't have that problem if the therapeutics available today were, were up to the task. Um, so uh, we, we, see, we see exactly that, that same value. Geographically, we're focused on, the, on North America. 
to begin with, with our clinics. And again, these are psychiatry-led integrated mental health clinics. Uh, initially, uh, three in Illinois, our flagship being in, in Chicago. And we're going to be expanding to three other states uh, in the next 90 to 120 days. Um, and we're and we're doing it through the identification of leading psychiatrists uh, that are that are well positioned to adopt uh, the, the novel therapies. In terms of our technical approach, um, we hope to provide data uh, to companies like Awaken to, to process. Our focus is to is to create that is to be a repository of best practices. So. Uh, Everything that happens on the research front will change when it meets the reality of, forgive the use of this term, but uh, the commercial availability of, of therapy. Uh, and the best practices will evolve. Um, so with Tovana Solutions, we're gonna have an evergreen library of best practices for the therapeutics that are developed under, under Risana and for therapeutics that are developed elsewhere because we certainly don't want to limit clinicians in the therapeutic options that are available to them to treat their patient. Um, so we, we hope that the work that the companies on this call and, and other legitimate companies in the industry develop, that we're seen as a way of, of, um, of proliferating uh, those, those therapies. And, and Nadia, I know you guys are, are dipping your toes into kind of the drug development side. So could you talk, could you talk a little bit about your decision to get involved in the, the drug development side, not just strictly the production side? Yeah, we, are, we do have a clinical trial arm of SciGen um, that's being led by Mark Hayden. Um, and we'll be focused on an LSD, LSD drug development and a clinical trial. You know, while the world is enamored with psilocybin, we're super excited about LSD um, at SciGen. And, and I, think it's, I, I think it's a bit of an overlooked drug um, and it has some really mm -hmm. exciting, uh, we're gonna be doing some really exciting things with it. And I think the, you know, interest Danny and, and Peter, um, my dad, that's his, that's his favorite drug to make. So, uh, and he's very good at it. Um, I think, I think we also recognize too, at the same time, like I, I'm a little biased cause I'm on the sales side of things. Um, you know, we recognize the massive undertaking that it, just, just to focus on doing production. Um, so, you know, from that side of it, we are going to be the best at what we do, which is make and sell drugs. That is our primary focus. That will be the best value for us, for our customers, for our investors, and then, you know, ultimately the patients. And I should clarify, the customers are other businesses. We don't actually, uh, you know, maybe the LSD product down the road will be direct to patients, but um, right now our, our model is to, to other companies in the space like Awaken or Wasana or whoever would be looking for material. Um, so it's, I don't think it's wrong to say to focus on all the things, um, but I think, you know, uh, being 100% dedicated to what you primarily want to do, um, you know, which for me is supporting these companies through preclinical all the way through to market authorization. So I don't just disappear as soon as I, I sell you the drugs. I'm there to support you through um, your regulator meetings, through what you need for your, your CMC data. Data, every, everything that you would need along the way, we're, we're here to support these companies. That's so much better that. customer service than the other drug dealers I've known <laughs> in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they want you. They want. They want you to call them back, but they don't want to chit chat right. after. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And and and, and Anthony and Hyan, you both kind of referenced, you know, technology playing a role, technology and and data. So I want to kind of dig into that for a little bit. Um, you know, how, how are each of your companies and Nadia as well, you know, how are you guys leveraging, if you give us some more detail, how are you guys leveraging technology to help achieve your mission? Um, so uh, ha happy to answer first. Um, I guess from our perspective, they're, they're in, they're kind of in three categories. Um, they're enabling tools for our team to be just better and more efficient. So we've got, you know, the usual stuff for running our clinics and for engaging with our, our future potential patients in clinic and post treatment. Needless to say, they both act as data data, data repositories as well in a compliant manner. Um, they're also then um, tools that we will be looking to, to develop in due course, which is the, the data and analytics part but um, we're, we're also, you know, lo looking at how we can use tools 
to improve the efficiency and consistency with how psychedelic assisted psychotherapy could be delivered as well. So not just tools to enable, to, you know, sort of enabling technologies for, for therapists to deliver therapy in the clinic, but also actually how could we kind of re-engineer the, re-engineer the distribution system as well. Um, but that's, you know, a little, a little bit, a little bit further down the road for us. So enabling technologies for our own team, enabling technologies for therapists in their own firms, but also then how could we potentially change some of the delivery mechanisms for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in, in the future. Hi. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll repeat what I said earlier, perhaps uh, just a little more depth. Um, we're focused on enabling the therapeutic community. Uh, we, the, there's a wonderful place for, for the apps that are out there. I, I, I don't disparage them at all. I think the, the, the trip apps have a value in the sense that one, one trip experience is an anecdote, 10,000 becomes mindable data. But that's not our focus. Our focus is, is professional grade clinical tools that will be regulatory adherent the world over uh, because we are dealing with, with sensitive patient data. Uh, so Tovana Solutions integrates into EMR, uh, in, into ele uh, the electronic medical record systems and the PMS is the practice management systems uh, used in uh, mental health facilities today. Uh, and it's a, it, it's a tool that will provide the protocols of use from intake all the way through integration, including uh, uh, biometric feedback and uh, patient data capture, both passive and, and active. We've partnered with, uh, with two companies, uh, one of which supplies uh, uh, patient engagement uh, platform technology for the likes of Kaiser Permanente in the United States, uh, Maccabi here in Israel. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch, knowing the environment we're going into. Uh, we're, we're not just looking at ketamine practices that are doing cash on the barrel business. We're looking 18, 24, 36 months down the road as the cascade of legalization of these therapies comes to uh, psychiatric practices that are technologically sophisticated, uh, that grapple with insurance. And we're going to enable them with an easily integrated tool to ensure adherence to best practice protocol um, and we're going to be tracking not just the data from patients, but also the, the usage data from the physicians. Awesome. N Nadia? Sure we sauna solutions, not Tovana solutions. We'll take <laughs> yeah. the language. You'll, get, you'll get used to changing that. <laughs> not, Nadia, pleasure. anything on the technology side? You know, I, um, I'm the relationship and sales expert on our team. I'm not the sciencey one when it comes to technology for manufacturing, but I do know we have some very interesting manufacturing and scale up technology that we're implementing um, and it will ensure we can stay competitive in this space for years to come. So that's about awesome. all I have to say on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and I know any psychedelic panel without an IP question would not be a psychedelic panel. So. I, Anthony, I'm going to kick it over to you. I know, you know, IP obviously on, on the drug development side is a very, very important piece of it. So talk to us a little bit about just in general, the importance of IP for these drug development companies, then more specifically what Awaken's approach is with respect to IP. Yeah, so absolutely happy to do so. Look, so so back to what I said as to why VCs and capital markets tend to like drug drug development, drug discovery, is because it's easier to model, and that part of making it easier to model is twenty to current current present net present value of 20, 20 years future revenue streams. You can only have those twenty years future revenue streams if you've got freedom to operate with whatever drug that you've developed, and you tend to freedom to operate means that no one else has done it. So then. That's only one stage. You can then got to wrap it in a fairly robust patent. And not only do you have to patent the molecule, but you've really got to patent how the molecule is going to be used. And you've got to back it up with, with data to, to back up the statements around how it's going to be used to, to really have a robust uh, patent strategy. Um, so that's at a very, very, very high level. That's, that's, that's our approach. Um, so where we are with regard to IP to protect our future revenue streams is you know, as, and it's a contentious issue, right? And I've heard some of the debates, et cetera, but something like addiction is a fairly, fairly substantial challenge to fix. In order to fix that challenge, you've got to develop the drugs. And because it's psychedelics, you've got to develop the therapies. You've then got to bring those through 
the full gamut of preclinical for the drugs and clinical for the drugs and therapy combined in multiple territories. That is a significant bill. To me, it's the capital markets that's great because the capital markets can help us secure the capital in order to execute these programs to enable us to help individuals, their families and their communities who are being stricken in an unremitting fashion with some of these addictions. Um, and capital markets require that patent strategy that I mentioned before. So for us, with regard to drug discovery and drug development, um, we've got two work streams going. We've got a work stream where we developed, we acquired some assets from Professor David Nutt's consultancy company. We, analyzed, we did that in March. We analyzed those assets. We've identified two series that have potential. Um, those series are intactogens. So like MDMA, but MDMA is an intactogen. These are different intactogens. Um, we believe that the, um, they're unique in their ability to work quicker. So they'll work in a two hour window, we believe, uh, therefore enabling, better enabling um, the treatments that we want to be delivered in a more efficient manner, because we all know time is the most valuable resource in the world. And what we can do, if we can do it in a two hour window and a two hour recovery window, that's better than a six hour window and a six hour recovery window. So what we've done is we've filed the patents on those, we're in synthesis at the moment, and we're gonna get in vivo and vitro in due course. Um, and then we're also running a program with Evotech, which I mentioned before, we're a drug discovery company. We've got a whole load of hits coming out of that program. And again, we're gonna wrap those in patents as well, once we've got freedom to operate and bring those through. And then at that stage, you know that you've got something worth going to invest in to bring forward through the whole preclinical phase and out and beyond. I think it's a bit of a different debate around the more the generics of the traditional pharmaceuticals or sorry, the traditional psychedelics um, as to what is the appropriate IP protection pathway around those. And certainly for us, we're looking to pursue regulatory protection rather than IP protection, certainly for MDMA um, with what we're doing to run a suite of trials to secure marketing authorization for MDMA assisted psychotherapy to treat alcohol use disorder in the UK EU. Um, and we're doing a sort of a hybrid model for ketamine. It'll be regulatory protection for ketamine to treat alcohol use disorder, but we're assessing our options uh, for to, treat, to treat behavioral addictions um, as to whether or not that's going to be a regulatory pathway or, or, or a, an IP pathway. Got it. And I think I got time for one more question. Nadi, I'm going to have this last question for you. So I, I know a lot of what we're seeing, at least my my investment firm, is a lot of the producers of these compounds are coming out of Canada. So so obviously there's there's something going on in Canada. What is it about Canada, um, perhaps their regulations, that's attracting so many companies to try to set up production in Canada? Well, it's certainly not our freezing winters, um, but I think I think Canada has a you know we've established ourselves as a leader. Um, in acceptance and positive attitude, you know, especially in the medicalization and legalization of cannabis. I feel like psychedelics is just the natural leap from there for us. Um, you know, I hope and believe that our regulator will be a world leader in supporting clinical trials. And, um, you know, Canadians as a whole are very liberal, um, our attitudes towards drugs. Um, so I think we have you know, we also have some really incredible scientific minds in Canada that are really interested in this space. Um, so it, you know, increases the innovation and, and research and drug development that's happening here. Um, you know, another new thing that's come up is the Canadian Psychedelic Association is being launched right now. I think it's a really interesting collaboration. I think it's the spirit of how Canadians work together. Um, you know, as the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so, you know, we're just so darn nice. Everyone wants to come here. So awesome. That, that's, that's great. That, anything else, Ian? Did you have something to add? No, I was just going to echo it. I'll vouch for that. I'm uh, born and raised <laughs> in the States, but I'm a proudly, I'm a natural, proudly American. I'm also a proudly naturalized Canadian. My, my children are born there. I spent 16 years in Canada before I became a proudly naturalized Israeli. Got it. Amazing. Awesome. Well, yeah. well I'm, we're, we're all up on time. So really, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank the panelists for, for joining us. It's been a great discussion. And uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time. And uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of the panels. Have a good thank, you, thank you so much, everyone. Good to meet you. Take care.